amazing panel. Kicking us off and moderating this panel is Professor Mike Janisarith from Stanford University. Mike, over to you, sir. Right. Thank you, Kostov. Uh, so yes, I'm Mike Janisarith, and I'm uh, going to be moderating, facilitating, keeping these guys in line, maybe, uh, in their discussion of this topic of computational thinking in a post-logo world. And uh, I'm going to have it here joined by Cynthia Solomon, who is an educational technology expert, one of the co-developers of the Logo system. Uh, I think you actually were a director at Atari Cambridge Research Lab and developed educational material, led the development of educational materials for the One Laptop Per Child Foundation. Uh, Owen Astrakhan, who's a um, professor of computer science teaching practice at Duke University, if I get that right. And Brian Harvey, who's a teach, uh, teach, prof, emeritus teaching professor of computer science at Berkeley and also the co-developer of the Beauty and Joy of Computing curriculum. Okay, so let me try to set the stage with just a few words before I turn it over to these folks to make their remarks. So mid-1960, Seymour Papert came to the United States and together with Marvin Minsky founded the MIT AI Lab. Seymour's interest was in education, and in 1967, he and Wally Furzeig from Bolt, Baranek, and Newman uh, established the Logo project and system. So for those of you who may not know it, Logo was most thought and most commonly viewed as being this little turtle that sat on the floor and was easily controlled by typing little commands at a computer program. And it became a fairly well-known uh, technology in the world of, of education for a couple of reasons. First of all, it was really easy to use, but it was also very versatile. As they used to say, it had a no, low floor and no ceiling because children could learn how to, to type low, to, to learn logo, how to use the logo system. And uh, it could be used for very sophisticated uh, purposes as well by experts. Okay, so that was one good thing. The second thing was programming logo was not an end in itself. In fact, programming logo was used primarily to learn other things like mathematics, science, music, and so forth. All of those things could be done and taught better by using logo, by using this little robotic turtle. So it raised the notion that programming, computation is not only about programming, there's more to it than that. Okay, now fast forward to 2006, and Jeanette Wing wrote an uh, article on computational thinking in the com com communications of the ACM. And that article has since become fairly widely read and cited because this notion of computational thinking, I think, captured people's imaginations. And before we go too far about wondering what computational thinking is, let me just read to you what uh, actually she and Larry Snyder and Jan Cuny wrote about that. Uh, their definition was this, computational thinking is the thought process involved in formulating problems and their solutions so that the solutions can be represented in a form that can be effectively carried out by an information processing agent. Word programming isn't in there. Computational thinking, as they said, was a way of solving problems, designing problems, and understanding human behavior that draws on concepts fundamental to computer science. So you have to understand computation as a part of doing other aspects of, of intellectual activity, whether it be in the sciences or in the arts, there's fundamentally computational issues involved. And so it was kind of a continuation of that notion that began with the logo idea that you're not just teaching computer programs, you're not just teaching computer science, you're teaching a lot of things through the mechanisms of the computer. Okay, so what we like to do is to talk about how that idea has evolved and how it plays out in our current interest in CS for all, for high schoolers and, and, and others in society. And so I'm gonna, hoping that my panelists here will have something to say about that topic one way or another, and I'm not sure whether they'll agree with each other or disagree with each other. Let's find out. So we'll start with Cynthia. Okay, well, <clears throat> I just wanna say a couple of things about the start of Logo. In fact, it was 1966 when Seymour and Wally and I got together and somebody named Danny Barbro was also there and we plotted out the first version of Logo. In, um, and we were at a company called Bolt, Brannick & Newman 
and in uh, 68, 69, Seymour and I team taught a group of seventh graders. Um, and after that, we went to MIT. Before, let me say, the reason Logo came into being was Seymour watched some kids in their algebra class using BASIC, which is an algebraic programming language, and thought it was rather difficult for them to learn algebra if they didn't know it using an algebraic language. And so what happened is uh, he wanted to design a language for children. And the key to it was what do kids like to play with? And at that time, we thought they liked to play with words and sentences. So the initial version of Logo was playing with words and sentences. After working for a year with these seventh graders, it became clear that something co more concrete was needed. And that's when turtles came about. Turtle geometry became a very rich micro world. And um, thereafter became a big search for other micro worlds. And there have been. Today, there are several. Anyway, um, the important thing about Logo and what we did with kids is learning to program was a way that kids could learn about themselves as learners. They could debug the program, and they could also debug themselves. There was an identification that bugs were good things, and you had to spend a lot of time. That's what programmers do. They spend a lot of time debugging. Um, my major. Uh, objection, let me go right into it, with what um, Wing wrote was, although you see programming as part of it, I see her separating programming from computer science. And for me, computer science is about thinking. It isn't about data structures. It, it isn't um, about whether variables are persistent or not. It's about um, Learning about yourself as a learner. Minsky, my, one, my two heroes, well, I have three. But the two were Seymour Papert and Marvin Minsky. And one of the reasons I'm here is Seymour's incapacitated, and Marvin died in January. But Marvin um, thought about computing and programming. And what the object ought to be is um, kids learning, uh, making mental models of what the problems might be that they're looking at. And um, that has to do with debugging. Anyway, I think that programming is an essential but not the major focus. And so for w what I see in, I'm more familiar with elementary than I am with college or high school, although because of these guys and SNAP and App Inventor, I'm, I'm more and more familiar. Um, but for elementary, what I noticed a lot was that teachers were teaching syntax and not semantics. And that's where people get the idea uh, that don't teach programming. Well, programming isn't syntax. I used to have discussions, you teach forward 10 before you teach forward 100. Well, that's a silly question. You know, you want the turtle to move, so you speak to it. And try a few things. My favorite line with kids was, try it. <laughs> they used to mimic me. <laughs> and they used to go around saying, try it. <laughs> but anyway. Um, I, I am very concerned and worried about this new push for everybody having computer science in their lives because not everybody are the people in this room. And the interpretation of computer science being, again, uh, syntactic and not semantic, um, not because you're doing this because you have a goal. And your goal doesn't have to be the same as mine. 
it, it's just somewhere in the back of your head. Maybe you're just experimenting and eventually you turn it into something very beautiful. Or not, doesn't matter. But you've got an idea and you're going to develop that idea. And um, syntax doesn't do it for me. Okay. Uh, Owen. I am Owen Ashkan. I do teach at Duke University, and for the past eight years, I've been working on computer science principles, and that's going to inform what I have to say about computational thinking in a postmodern world. But first, Cynthia, you have three heroes. We heard about two. Alan Kay. Okay. Wow. So you got to see him. Alan's today, changed my life too. The three of them. Computational thinking in a post-logo world. So I think we have uh, a few problems facing us as a community trying to reach and get everybody to learn computer science. We don't have a definition of what computer science is, much less computational thinking, that we can agree on. I think that would be a great thing for us to do. I think we have what I am now calling, for reasons that may become clear, the curse of Carol. So Carol the robot is <laughs> the came right after logo. And Carol was about understanding the semantics and trying to get at functional and procedural decomposition. But the problems were all micro world problems. They were all puzzle based problems. And I think what, we, what I have learned in computer science principles is that puzzles don't really work as motivators for a large group of people. Um, they work for me, but that's where all the people are. And so you also should be a little suspect of what I'm telling you, because I am this old white guy. Um, but I have been working for more than I've been working on computer science principles to make it clear that what we should be talking about is problems that you need a computer and programming to solve. And computational thinking will help you understand how to solve those problems. If they don't need a computer, they need a calculator, pencil and paper, I don't think that's computer science. I think for what we do is about understanding scale. People can learn to write programs and code. And we should treat that the way they learn the algorithms to do multiplication and addition and division. We don't treat that really as teaching math when we get to high school. We assume that you have a basic facility with some algorithmic skills that let you get to solving the problems that are interesting. And I think. I would like to get programming to be that, so that when we get to high school, we can solve problems that students think are interesting to them. And that, so the computational thinking should be about meeting the students where they are. I'm teaching a course this semester, which is CompSci 101, Python programming where I am, but for neuroscience majors. They all had to have a neuroscience course. My co-instructor is a neuroscientist. All the problems are things that neuroscientists want to solve. And these students wanted to solve them. So the programming was easy. I they would pick a project that they wanted to do that required understanding lists and functions and a whole bunch of other things. But the goal wasn't to learn Python. The goal was to be able to run cognitive experiments and be able to interpret the results and graph them and run statistical analysis on these. And there, the scale of, of these things required that they understand programming. And so to me, that was a problem that met them where they were. And that's kind of one of the things I've learned about computer science principles is meeting all our learners where they are, not where I think they are. What I think is beautiful is not what they think is beautiful. Telling them what I think is beautiful is great, as long as it helps them solve the problem that they need to solve. And so what I think we need to work at is getting away from Logo and Carol as, as why we want to program. They are useful tools to motivate program and the syntax and the ideas behind programming. But we need to get to a place where computational thinking means, where does computer science come in as distinct from programming? I want everybody to be a programmer to solve the problems that they need to solve. Like I think they need to learn math and geometry and algebra and calculus when that's relevant to solve the problems that they need to solve. So that's what I think of computer science and computational thinking in a post-logo world are about. Interesting. OK. Brian. OK. Um, I'm Brian Harvey, UC Berkeley, a professional troublemaker. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to make some trouble here. Uh, first of all, I have to say I'm a little uncomfortable 
to be on a panel with the word post logo right. in its name. Thank you. <laughs> because I'm still getting a steady stream of bug reports about Berkeley logo, um, which is how I know that people are actually still using it. Um, so logo isn't dead. Um, and it isn't dead despite uh, the presence of um, easier to use in some ways graphical languages uh, because uh, it is extraordinarily powerful. And um, if I'm trying to solve problems, I still sometimes program it in Logo. Um, partly because you know I'm familiar with it, but also partly because um, if it's words and sentences, uh, nothing beats Logo, actually. Um, now, <laughs> on to computational thinking. <laughs> um, I'm in a funny position because um, what I'm doing professionally right now is um, developing and, and teaching to teachers um, a CS principles course. Um, and there are a bunch of reservations that I have about the whole CS principles project. And the worst of them is uh, in CS principles, um, there are a list of seven big ideas which aren't so bad and six computational thinking practices, none of which is programming. Computer scientists don't program, according to leaders in our field. Well, that's crazy, right? I mean, sorry, computer scientists do program. And furthermore, even when they're doing things that aren't programming, like building mm -hmm. a mathematical foundation for computing or connecting computing to other areas or all those things, um, they're doing it in the service of computer programming, which is in turn in the service of some problem or other. But there wouldn't be computer science at all. We wouldn't be sitting here talking about computer science if computer programming weren't at its center. Um, and I think, uh, people are kind of afraid of computer programming. And they're afraid of it partly because uh, we live in a time in which um, most adult computer programmers use really terrible programming languages. And in particular, in the world of high schools, um, everybody thinks that what programming means is learning Java, the second worst programming language ever after C++, um, which is all about syntax. You can't add two and two in Java without a page of syntax. Um, and so, yes, it's not about the programming language. I mean, the point isn't to teach a particular programming language, but boy, the programming language can sure get in the way. Um, and the great thing about Logo and the great thing about Scratch and uh, the great thing about Snap, which is our kind of scratch plus plus, if you will, um, <laughs> adding some of the deeper things that they left out on purpose in Scratch, um, is that you can just sit down and start using it in two minutes. And uh, you don't know everything, but you know enough to do stuff that's fun and interesting. So I'm going to take one more minute and tell you about my least favorite computer science lesson. And it's one that everybody except me loves. And it's called PBJ. Um, it's the peanut butter and jelly sandwich lesson in which the teacher brings into class a loaf of bread and a jar of jelly and you know, all that <laughs> other stuff and says to the kids, OK, tell me how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And then the teacher tries as hard as possible to do the wrong thing consistent with what the class says. Right? So you end up with peanut butter on the floor and, and you know, a sandwich with the bread on the inside and all that stuff. And the point of the lesson is supposed to be that when you're talking to computers, you have to be very precise. But that isn't what the lesson teaches. What the lesson teaches is that computers are out to get you. And the precision that you need, which you do sometimes in talking to computers, it's not because computers are out to get you. It's because computers aren't as smart as you are. right? Not that they're smarter and, and trying to show you up. 
it's that they're not as smart as you are, and you have to make allowances, just like you do when you're talking to your younger sibling, right? Um, there's a huge community right now of kids who love Scratch. And they love it mostly uh, without a lot of help from adults. They learn from each other, except for the in implicit help that there's some great design in, in Scratch, uh, visual metaphors for computer science ideas. Um, nobody says, why should kids be made to learn Scratch? I've never heard that anyone say that. You know, why should kids have to learn uh, computational thinking? It's the wrong question. Um, computer programming is so much fun that if your kids don't think so, you're doing something wrong. Thank you. Well, you have a fan at least one. <laughs> OK, um, with those opening statements, the format now is we're gonna let, I'm going to let the panelists respond to each other's comments. But uh, we're going to take my prerogative as moderator to start that off by asking a couple of questions. By the way, this panel, I was originally a panelist. But then we realized that Cynthia had a lot more to say than I did, so we swapped <laughs> roles. Nevertheless, I have a few questions. One, the first question is um, more responsive to what you folks were saying. So I heard several distinctions being made by you folks. One of those was the distinction between what's programming and what's computer science. And there's somehow a difference between those two things. There's programming and then there's computer science. There's also a question, a distinction to be made between computational thinking and programming, if I understand correctly. Yes. And no, only by Wing's definition. Oh, okay. So, so there is programming, which means typing in a programming language, and then there is computational thinking, which does not necessarily mean making a computer program do something. Uh, you know, we musicians follow scores. Um, dancers follow something called Leben notation to decide how they're going to do the things. Cooks follow recipes. They're all thinking computationally. There's some computation that's going. They're following a procedure at any rate, if not making a PB and J sandwich as an example. But that's not the same as writing a program in some programming language, or is it? So the question is, computer programming, computer science, computational thinking, are there two ideas here or three? Does anybody want to say there are two, or does anybody want to say there are three? Well, according to some literature, Seymour is the one that first used the phrase computational thinking. And if he used it, you can be sure that Jeanette Wing's definition would not fit <laughs> in, in his domain. Um, the, um, when we designed Logo, we thought of kids being able to write, to read, to compute, to draw, to play music, to record music, um, to use the, those ideas in their physical skills. For example, we used to teach kids to juggle because it was so procedural. We taught them to walk on stilts, again, because it was so procedural. So, Logo, like Lisp, which is what Logo was considered baby of, it was procedural. You make things into procedures and debug those procedures. Um, and you debug your thinking. I go back to that. You debug thinking using computational techniques. And I use the word computational techniques a lot. It doesn't mean that I accept whatever computational thinking is. Thinking is thinking. Seymour's great line was, you can't think about thinking without thinking about thinking about something. So if you choose to think about, um, that was one of the reasons we wanted something concrete. And turtle geometry is a rich area. So, so can, can I? Yeah, can interrupt. I, Go ahead. Uh, no, I want, to, I want to see if anybody else yeah. would like to chime in here. Oh, and in particular, given what two you said. Two ideas. There are two ideas. There's programming, which is part of computer science. That's 
really clear in, an, in a university setting. It seems kind of obvious, and so I don't think we should pick up a different definition for K-12 than what we have. Um, I think computational thinking, I would like to take as a broad encompassing term about our enterprise. I don't, if you ask, hey, 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 kids, are you, are you, what's mathematical thinking, or biological thinking, or physics thinking, or I think we'll get into trouble trying to differentiate ourselves as somehow very special compared to the other academic enterprises. And while I think we're special, I know for a fact that not everyone thinks computer science is special in the academic settings. Not everybody wants to study it in detail. So I think we can use computational thinking as computational and thinking about what we do, but not, for me, not as a metaphor for a way of thinking so that when I, as in Jeanette Wing's article, when I, when I create, when I put things in my backpack, I'm thinking I'm solving a bin packing problem. No, I'm putting things in my backpack. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. And, and, and so that's for me, that's what it is. Te thinking about programming and thinking about computer science, I'd be happy to give you a definition of that if you'd like. And I also don't like the peanut butter and jelly algorithm, so I'm, Brian's not the only. So, so one just to be world. clear, is there, is there computational thinking without computers? I, I don't want to even think about that because there's trees in the woods too, but I don't think about that either and falling and sound okay. making. And that's a, that seems like a, a question for <laughs> metaphysics and philosophy. And you know what I'm doing? I want to teach computer science. And if I'm thinking about computer science, I'm happy to call that computational. So thing. you were using the word computer, though. The computer is an essential part of this, of this for you. Just like the telescope. OK. Yep. Brian, do you have a comment? So, so I think that um, I'm a political cynic. Um, and I think that. Some of the way people have framed the discussion has to do with um, political strategizing. Um, I said this in a different context in the last session, but in the 21st century, um, you're not allowed to offer kids optional experiences. Things in school are either mandatory or forbidden. Um, and that's because there's only so much time in the school day and we, things keep popping up, you know? Um, life education, whatever that means. Um, so computational thinking is a way of getting computer science past people who consider computer science to be a special niche concern. Oh yes, computer science is a special niche concern, but computational thinking, that's for everybody. <laughs> um, I really think that's where, where that comes from. And also partly, I think this is dead wrong, it comes from this idea that um, I heard a lot at the beginning of this whole project eight years ago or 10 years ago, whenever it was, um, that girls don't like programming. Because girls think programming means sitting in a cubicle in front of a screen and never talking to another human being. And therefore, in order to get girls in, we have to kind of hide the computer programming, although that's not quite the way they put it. Um, and, you know, I think that's self-defeating. I mean, I think, yes, you can take stuff like um, building a multimedia project to explain something or other using PowerPoint or using Photoshop or using iMovie or something. Um, and you can call that computational thinking or you can call it computer science. Um, and you can get kids interested in it who aren't interested in programming, uh, but that's a dead end. You know, it doesn't get you into the fun stuff, which is getting the computer to do something that you thought of rather than getting the computer to do something that somebody at Microsoft thought of and gave you a tool to do. OK, so, so I still have one more question pending, <laughs> even though we're running a little short on time. Uh, as I said, I was not the moderator of this panel originally, but the original moderator did ask us panelists some very interesting questions, one of which has not been spoken, although you just alluded to a bit of it in something you said, Brian. One of her first questions was, with all this emphasis on CS for all, are we putting too much emphasis on 
compute, computational thinking, computer science, computer programming, whichever one you want to address, as a job skill rather than as a life skill? Is there a reason to view all this as a life skill, something everybody should know to get through their lives, not just to make money? So I'd like to ask you all to comment on that issue. Uh, Cynthia, you want us to choose your question. Do you want to give your answer first? <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, my answer is it's a life skill. <laughs> that's, that's my answer. Not, not a surprise that you were going to say that. <laughs> Well, that's my answer too. It seems pretty obvious that not everybody wants a job as a software engineer or even using, oh, they don't have a choice. They're going to have to use some computational skills no matter that's what right. they do in all likelihood. Right. You can see these unbelievably interesting videos of farmers using these algorithmic giant wagons that are using AI to plant seeds the right way. It's like, well, if everybody's doing it. They're Everybody has to have an understanding of some aspects of computer science because of the digital world we live in, which is meeting our real world. Bits and atoms, they're kind of mingled. So but the computer is not necessarily part of that algorithm, or is it in your view? It's not about the computer. It's about, is programming doing something to help whatever you're doing? Might you have to use some debugging skills? some skills in programming, some skills in understanding what computer science can do for you and how it's affecting you. I'm just kind of curious about the farmer out there who's deciding how he's going to plant his seeds. No, he's just pulling a wagon behind him and it's, and it's got $100,000 worth of computational it, stuff in it. That's deciding. That's your, okay, that's your view. As opposed to his thinking, I'm going to do the rows this way or that way in his head. Okay. Yeah, Fine. Right. She doesn't know enough. It's a farmer. It's, it's they. Touche. Um, well, yeah, sure, a life skill, but you know, in my role as troublemaker, there are a trillion things that everybody needs. There are so many things that everybody needs that there's no chance of them having them all, right? So everybody needs, one of my favorite examples, uh, enough expertise on nuclear physics to know whether uh, the nuclear power plant they want to put in my state is safe or not. Well, that's not going to happen. Nobody's going to know enough. I mean, not everybody is going to study that. Um, we live in a world, and we've lived in a world for the last, you know, eight or nine centuries, maybe, in which you can't know everything that people need to know to be effective in the world. Uh, and so uh, we invented this thing called specialization. Um, you know, well, we invented that more than 800 years ago. That was like thousands of years ago. Uh, and it works pretty well for us. Um, so yeah, it's a life skill, but no, it just so happens the programming computer is a lot of fun for a lot of people because of all the different things you can do with it. Okay, um, we have about one minute left. <laughs> I was just wondering if anybody have a pressing question on this subject or a comment. Panelist prerogative, I have a, I have a, I have a thing. Okay, really, go ahead, take really. the minute. So, <laughs> fun, fun. It turns out, Brian, I'm gonna let you in on the secret. There are at least six things more fun than programming a computer. You're, you're not doing it right. You're not allowed to do it, <laughs> And I don't think everybody should be made to do it. So there, I just well, think everybody should have the opportunity. Okay, some of those six. Fair enough. That sounds like a good place to uh, to end the, the discussion. So if you help, maybe help me thank the panelists for their comments. <laughs>